Hello and welcome to Nursing Care of a Ventilated Patient. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's take a look at some of these principles of mechanical ventilation. First of all, understanding what the ventilator is and what it does, we have this machine over here in this diagram on the right hand side and then the patient on the left and you can see that there's two tubes that go from the machine over to the patient. One of them is the inspiratory limb which provides the air to the patient and then we have the expiratory limb allowing the patient to be able to exhale back through the machine. It's important that we're having the patient exhale back through the machine so we can monitor how much air is going in and how much air is coming out. Notice that those are two separate tubes going to and from the patient until we get down to the patient's endotracheal tube and then finally that tube goes down into the patient's trachea. In this case here we have a tracheostomy tube that is being used. The reasoning for having two different limbs, two different tubes going to and from the ventilator, first of all is that we want to be able to measure how much air is going in and out of the patient and we want to be able to humidify the air that is going into the patient's lungs. At the same time, we don't want that exhaled air and potentially bacteria, etc. to be mixing with the inhaled air as well. Let's talk a little bit about the differences between normal breathing, which is a negative pressure phenomena, and ventilation, which is a positive pressure phenomena. In negative pressure breathing, it's primarily driven by the diaphragms. The diaphragm drops, and that's going to cause a negative pressure in the chest wall, which is going to suck air in from the lungs. It's going to be pulling air in through the airways. Now, the difference in physiology here is that when the diaphragm drops it's pulling on the lower parts of the lung so it's kind of like grabbing a balloon from the outside and pulling it open we're going to be filling those outside pieces of that balloon or of the lung we're going to be filling those areas much more readily than we will when we're blowing air in at the level of the trachea so switch to mechanical ventilation now we have a tube in place and we're blowing air into the lungs that's going to primarily fill the airways and hopefully we'll be able to fill some of those alveoli but it doesn't get out to the distal areas as well as our normal negative pressure breathing process does. In addition there's also changes that occur in the chest in relationship to pressure. With normal breathing, which is a negative pressure phenomenon on the left there, you can see the diaphragm drops, chest wall expands, it's creating a vacuum and that's what pulls air into the lungs. This is also going to create a vacuum around the heart and the mediastinum. So there's going to be hemodynamic consequences of having negative pressure in the chest wall. Over on the right hand side, we have the positive pressure ventilation that's being given by a ventilator. So now we're pushing air in with our ventilator and you can see it's primarily pushing air into the trachea and the airways and then hopefully we're getting down there to the distal parts of the lung. But we're primarily filling the areas that are easy to fill. Kind of like blowing up a balloon. If you have one of those long skinny balloons and you start to blow it up, you're pushing air into it, you'll notice that it fills the area close to you first and then moves out distally. The same kind of thing happens with mechanical ventilation and our patient's lungs. We're filling the airways first and then later, if there's enough time for that air to get down there, we'll be filling the distal parts of the airways. In addition, of course, this is positive pressure and with positive pressure ventilation now, we are pushing air in and we're generating this positive pressure which is also causing positive pressure on the heart and the mediastinum and decreasing venous return back to the heart. In many cases, that will cause the patient to have decreased cardiac output. However, in a patient who has heart failure, decreasing venous return to the heart may actually be helpful. And you may see an increase in the patient's cardiac output as a result of decreasing the venous return back to the heart. It's important, of course, to maintain oxygenation in our patients who have mechanical ventilation. And we do that with uh, having our positive pressure ventilation, pushing air down into those alveoli. One of the additional adjuncts we can add to our mechanical ventilation is called PEEP, which is positive end expiratory pressure. So at the end of expiration, it's like pinching that balloon off before it collapses. So again, imagine you're blowing up a balloon and you release the balloon. What's going to happen? It's going to go 
right? And it's just going to collapse. So we don't want that to happen when we're ventilating our patient. So we provide some positive end expiratory pressure. At the end of expiration, we're providing positive pressure. And it's like pinching that balloon off before it deflates. So we're keeping that balloon open. And that's going to keep the alveolus open so that hopefully we'll be able to maintain good gas exchange. So as I mentioned already, airflow is going to change as a result of having positive pressure ventilation. Instead of pulling this alveolus open from the periphery, now we're pushing it open from the airways. Alveolar ventilation and perfusion can change too, and we may see changes in our PCO2 and our PO2 as a result of either inflating or not inflating those alveoli enough. Now, hopefully with mechanical ventilation, we're trying to see an increase in our PO2 and a decrease in our CO2 as we're able to ventilate and move more CO2 out and then perfuse and get more oxygen into the bloodstream. Interthoracic pressure changes, and again, we've mentioned that, how it affects our hemodynamics. Positive pressure ventilation could also cause barotrauma. That's trauma that's caused by having pressure. So there's a number of ways to help to prevent that. One is by having adequate sedation. Sedation not only helps to prevent barotrauma by keeping your patient from fighting the ventilator and causing these really high pressures in the thorax, but also decreases the work of breathing, decreases stress and catecholamine surges, which could cause the patient to have additional hemodynamic consequences. Maintaining our airway clearance by suctioning when appropriate will also help to decrease the amount of pressure in the thorax and decrease the chance of barotrauma. Limiting our airway pressures by using a low tidal volume strategy. Typically, we would use 5 to 6 milliliters per kilogram as our tidal volume in this low tidal volume strategy. And using moderate levels of PEEP. Now, moderate level does not necessarily mean very low, but uh, in, in most cases, we're going to be using somewhere between 5 and 12 centimeters of water of PEEP to be able to maintain oxygenation in our patients. In our, some of our patients who have ARDS, we may be using higher levels of PEEP, maybe in the higher teens and up to about 20 centimeters of water of PEEP. But we have to be careful that we're not causing barotrauma with some of these activities. Over in the picture, it's showing a patient who has a pneumothorax. A pneumothorax is air that's gotten into the pleural space as a result of puncturing the lung with these high pressures. Suctioning may be very helpful for your patient who's on mechanical ventilation, but again, we want to do it on an as-needed basis, so not on a regular scheduled basis. We only want to do suctioning when it's really appropriate and not doing unnecessary suctioning on our patients because, as you can see, there are a number of risks listed at the bottom of the page. There are hypoxia, bleeding, infection, increased intracranial pressure as we're suctioning. One of the things that happens is the patient's going to cough as we start to suction the patient, and that can increase intracranial pressure. Hemodynamic instability as we're changing the pressures in the thorax by doing our suctioning. Use the lowest amount of suction that is effective. Okay, of course, you've got to have enough suction in order to be able to get those secretions out, but we don't want to use too much that could be sucking all this air out of the patient and causing hypoxemia. Continuous suction for no more than 15 seconds. In many of our patients, it's going to be more, no, it's going to be no more than 10 seconds. And in fact, if your patient's really hemodynamically unstable, maybe no more than five seconds to get in there and get out to try and prevent the patient from developing instability. Use ASAP technique, technique and avoid the saline lavage. Saline lavage is designed to loosen up some of those secretions, but actually increases the patient's intrathoracic pressure and can increase the chance of barotrauma, while at the same time causing more hypoxemia. Our patients who are on mechanical ventilation typically are not moving around a lot on their own, so we're going to have problems with the potential for skin breakdown. When you look at these pictures here, you can see a number of different areas where the patient could have potential for skin breakdown. Notice a couple of them that are very consistent through all of the pictures. That is of the hips and the heels. Those are very consistent, so we want to be really careful about those areas. Some of the positioning we use for patients on mechanical ventilation include the semi-recumbent position, so the head of the bed up 30 degrees at least, 
or a prone position in many of our patients who have ARDS. And now we're seeing it more often with our patients who have COVID and severe COVID and the lung problems that associate with COVID, which is really just ARDS. Good lung up if the patient has unilateral disease. Make sure we're turning the patient, positioning the patient, patting the patients, those spots that are prone to developing skin breakdown. And those are different with the patient in the prone position. Make sure you're using your policy and procedure for your patients who are in the prone position. Maintaining perfusion, keeping in mind that we can't affect the lungs without affecting the heart. They're in the same cavity, and if we're making changes to the pressures in the thoracic cavity, it's going to affect the heart. So be aware of that. Be aware of those intrathoracic pressure changes. They come from PEEP. They come from suctioning. They come from patient positioning. And assess the patient's hemodynamics. Assess for changes in the blood pressure. Remember, systolic pressure reflects cardiac output. Heart rate and rhythm. Look for those changes, the urine output, the CVP, peripheral perfusion, and the chest x-ray possibly for changes that are occurring as a result of having changes in interthoracic pressure. Well, thank you for joining me for Nursing Care of the Ventilated Patient. My name is David Woodruff. Until next time.